Have you ever stopped to think that everything around you, from the device you are using to watch this video to the clothes you're wearing, has been intentionally designed by someone? It's okay if you haven't. After all, a design process only becomes apparent when its output ceases to function, causing frustration to the end user. Nonetheless, regardless of whether we are aware of such a process or not, it does exist, and it's everywhere. Why is this relevant, you might ask? Well, the interesting thing about this kind of awareness is that it grants us the ability to reflect on the consequences of design choices. That is, by being aware of the underlying dynamics behind a product or system, a user can decide whether to use it or not, and better yet, to change it in a way that enhances its functionality. This is a rather important insight, especially because of the feedback loops that dictate creator versus creation interactions. In the words of designer Leila Akaroglu, the world is designed and yet the world designs us. We are trapped in a dynamic feedback loop between what we create as a species and the ways in which our created artifacts make us a species. With this perspective in mind, it gets really interesting to consider the outcomes of different design approaches, especially the ones that can not only effectively solve our usability and functionality challenges, but that do so in intelligent ways. After all, if we follow Leila's thinking, num design may feed back num users. Such reasoning leads us to questions like, what is an intelligent design? What are examples of intelligent design around us? And how can we be inspired by such examples? There are no quick answers to such deep questions, but a walk into nature might help us to think more clearly about them. This way, we can contemplate trees and how they are true masters of efficient energy transformation. We can observe colonies of insects and their extraordinary self-organizing abilities. And if we look really carefully, we might even be able to grasp the interconnectedness and complexity of entire ecosystems, granting them resilience, diversity and adaptation. All these observations show us that nature itself embed a very special kind of intelligence, one that is characterized by finely attuned feedback loops between elements and their environment. Even more extraordinary is to think that this kind of intelligence has been the product of evolutionary dynamics that have been happening for billions of years, with constant iteration and refinement. Janine Benius, self-proclaimed nature nerd, is known for saying that the natural world is a consultant with 3.8 billion years of experience in R&D. And that makes a lot of sense if we think about it. Nature does have the best strategies for some of the most difficult design challenges out there. Perhaps the biggest challenge of all, sustaining and creating conditions conducive to life itself, as Janine highlights. Now, imagine if we are able to tap into this intelligence and incorporate it as part of our design processes. This is an opportunity for us to design artifacts, processes and whole systems that, beyond serving our pressing needs, can actually aid us in our own evolutionary saga. This is the potential of biomimicry. The practice of reconnecting and looking for design inspirations from nature is known as biomimicry. Despite its seemingly self-exploratory name, this design approach has deeper nuances that are well worth being explored. One of the first things to understand about biomimicry is that it is not limited to the creation of products through the direct use of natural elements or the imitation of shapes and forms found in nature. Instead, According to the Biomimicry Institute, biomimetic designs focus on function, they work like nature. Or in other words, the distinctive feature of biomimicry is the study and emulation of functional strategies to create sustainable solutions. This focus on function points at something really essential about the intelligence intrinsic to nature, which is its dynamic aspect. To understand this and be able to emulate functional strategies from nature, we need to put on biomimetic glasses that will allow us to look around us and see the ever-happening flows embedded in any natural process. Flows that, in interaction with matter, leave behind patterns manifested through color, shape, size, number and distribution. 
These, alongside a perception about nature's scale and speed, start to give us hints of how this intelligence operates. A finally attuned eye to such patterns can help a great deal at performing a conscious emulation of life's genius, as Janine puts it. That is the case because patterns can be abstracted away from their original context and applied to other areas, something that can be illuminating to a design process. A quick example of this is the abstraction of the swarm intelligence patterns we see in many groups of insects and animals for the purpose of designing good algorithms for autonomous vehicles. The interesting thing, though, is that if we look around carefully with our biomimetic glasses, we'll find out that there is actually an underlying set of patterns permeating everything that nature does, everything that is alive. And such a collection is extremely valuable for the design of anything that aims to emulate nature's qualities, what makes it an essential part of the biomimicry toolkit. Lucky for us, the Biomimicry Institute has done the work of compiling and describing such patterns, calling them nature's unifying patterns. The nature's unifying patterns are Nature uses only the energy it needs and relies on freely available energy. Nature recycles all materials. Nature is resilient to disturbances. Nature optimizes rather than maximizes. Nature rewards cooperation. Nature runs on information. Nature uses chemistry and materials that are safe for living beings. Nature builds using abundant resources, incorporating rare resources only sparingly. Nature is locally attuned and responsive. Nature uses shape to determine functionality. It's not difficult to imagine how any design process that incorporates all these patterns would be extremely successful. And even though it might be impossible to always use all of them, the main idea, according to the Institute, is that they can be translated into design specifications, quality control metrics, material selection, and other manufacturing or process choices. With that in mind, someone engaged in the design of anything should start applying the unifying patterns at the very beginning of their work, as well as all other steps, making sure that as many patterns are contemplated as possible. The creation of artifacts and products through the use of the biomimicry practice can yield amazing results, like this backpack, inspired by the way guavas store their seeds how armadillos protect their bodies, and how a specific type of moss found in the Mexican rainforest maintains homeostasis with its environment. However, the real power of biomimicry is at its systematic applications. As Dr. Daniel Christian Wall puts it, the first two decades of biomimicry have seen a huge rise in biomimetic patents and technologies in the fields of product and process design. We are now moving into applying life's principles and lessons to whole systems designed at the scale of whole cities and regions. Such a perspective is extremely exciting since we then start talking about biomimicry for the whole design of the entire infrastructural system, which in turn are deeply connected to the social fabric of our lives. And in no other place the creator-creation feedback dynamics discussed earlier are more relevant. In resonance with that, nature's underlying patterns can be best understood as system-level patterns, more appropriately used in the wholesome design of entire systems. This is not to say that one person or one group should use biomimicry to design entire systems that will solely govern our lives. Such a top-down approach has proven time and time again to be frail and corruptible. Instead, we should strive for the creation of multiple such systems by as many hands as possible that, if well embedded into nature's principles through its patterns, can interwoven and emerge as complex ecosystems. Using Dr. Daniel's words again, biomimicry at the systems level can inform regenerative development by creating ecosystems of collaboration engaged in social, ecological and economics regeneration at the local and bioregional scale. 
This possible reality might seem too far away from where we stand as a species today, but the truth is that the future is not completely predefined and it's up to all of us to co-create it, both in the way we imagine and actualize it. So why not think and act the biomimicry way? How could we bring forth organizations inspired by nature's patterns? How would cities behave if we understand them as living beings? How do we design economic systems that mimic the way resources flow in nature? How can we provide for our real needs through synergetic relationships with other forms of life? What path would our species take if we manage to leverage what interconnects us rather than what separates us? These are the key questions we need to think about, especially in the context of the 21st century, already marked by the influence of the human species in the self-regulating dynamics of the Earth's biosphere. And biomimicry may serve us a way as a framework for finding the answers we need. From this deeper understanding of the biomimicry practice, one can start to look at it really as a way to transform human behavior and design in order to connect with nature and with the source of creativity that is intrinsic to it. That is, a design approach that considers nature as a member, model and measure to humanity's challenges. So, in showing appreciation for nature's amazing strategies for life's challenges, biomimicry recognizes the importance of preserving it, its potential to result in regenerative design and consequently the need to reconnect with it. Of course, this is not a path free of challenges. One especially relevant relates to the principles underpinning any design process, biomimetic or not. As hinted at earlier, it's not necessarily the case that every biomimetic process will be inherently good for the community of life on Earth. This practice can actually be used for the design of destructive artifacts and systems. That's why it's essential to highlight the role of the principles behind any process. Or, in other words, the fundamental intentions that guide the creation of anything, that which comes before any sketching or prototyping. Unfortunately, it's not customary for us to engage in deep reflections about why is that that we do what we do, but this is key to safeguard ourselves against anything that can feed back in harmful ways. And that is true in design and in life in general. Such a care for how we create has never been more needed. After all, it is a fact that right now, many things are putting pressure over our finite resources, but full of creativity, earth. We are already in motion towards a dangerous path, and for now, inertia still makes the status quo look appealing. All this puts in a time with no precedence for our species, making regenerative patterns more required than ever. So it's time to listen to Mother Nature and let her guide the sketching.